My name is Kira Maloney and I'm a curator at the Los Angeles Municipal Art Gallery. Our current exhibition is COLA 2019, which showcases the work of 11 artists, each of whom is the recipient of the COLA Individual Artist Fellowship Award. So this award supports the artist to make a body of new work, which we are featuring in this exhibition. Municipal Art. So the first work that people will encounter is by artist Stephanie Taylor, and she has made a sound work called Municipal Art Song. The lyrics of this song are adapted from the press releases by the Department of Cultural Affairs, which sponsors the grant. And she has a system of notation where she derives uh, musical notes from vowel sounds, and that constitutes the song. So the song is a very jaunty number. It's reminiscent of educational programs like Schoolhouse Rock, and it gently pokes fun at bureaucratic language, while at the same time reaffirming the value of art for the public. Oh, so you feast until you're full. Art, unto you we do impart. So here we have a sculpture by Alice Kurnitz called Domestic Pavilion and this is designed as a kind of sheltered cozy space that the artist would actually inhabit in her studio. Um, it follows a kind of modernist aesthetic with very clean lines and simple forms and while she was preparing for this work she was spending a lot of time in nature, hiking, camping, she learned how to forage so she also wanted to include a number of utensils or implements that related to that work including twigs that can be used to make fire, and this piece of rope that's made from yucca that the artist learned how to produce. So here we have a sculpture by artist Katie Grinnan called Five Seconds of Dreaming. And in this work, the artist uses landscape as a metaphor for different states of consciousness such as sleeping, dreaming. The artist had her brainwaves measured while she was sleeping and with the resultant EEG diagram, she had this undulating waveform that we can see in these sculptures here. And that diagram doesn't tell you a lot about the narrative potential of a dream. And so Katie decided to use the diagram as a basis for a musical score. So not only are the instruments here undulating, we also have this same EEG form in a series of scores carved on trees and painted on these rocks. The artist added strings from a koto instrument and the sitar, and these instruments can then be interpreted by musicians who give a musical form to the artist's thoughts. Kim Fisher has created a group of works that explore boundaries and borders. For instance, in Los Angeles Hedge, we can see a 20 foot wide print of a garden hedge on paper, which has been installed on this wall. Not only is she exploring physical boundaries, of course the hedge is a common site demarcating public and private space in Los Angeles. She's also looking at the relationship between these aluminum prints and the paper. So there's a kind of play between light and shadow and depth here. Kim is inspired by the kind of everyday detritus of our lives. She takes pieces of paper from vintage magazines and replicates those forms in these large-scale works in the gallery here. So even though this looks like it was ripped out of a magazine, in fact, it's a paper print that has been digitally manipulated, but originally comes from this excerpt from the magazine. In Woman Behind Rocks, we can see how Kim adapts different materials in one installation. So here we have this nine foot stretch of paper which mirrors the form of a piece of paper ripped. Then we have a print on aluminum and Kim is exploring different kinds of finishes here. So we have a high gloss, a semi-matte and a matte finish here. Lots of different kinds of black and she creates a really beautiful wave between these mountains. So there's a bit of a visual kind of confusion over what's to the foreground and what's in the background. So in this installation by Enrique Castrojan, we can see five male bodies on the walls. And for Enrique, it was very important that he represent the bodies of men of color. Their bodies are striated by these paper strips, 
and the paper contains data relating to HIV statistics in Los Angeles. So Enrique works as a HIV counselor for an LGBT center. And for him, it was very important to initiate a dialogue about disease. And I think that here, really the bodies are foregrounded, so it's not possible to obscure the subjective experience of disease with all these seemingly objective pieces of data. Um, in this installation, Enrique really foregrounds the people at the heart of that experience. For this exhibition, Sabrina Geschwantner has created a series of works that are part of a larger project called Cinema Sanctuary. And the sanctuary is intended as a safe space for women that's dedicated to films by early female cinematic pioneers. In that space, ultimately the artist would like to screen films by those directors and also install these 2D works. So these are called film quilts and they're comprised of 35 millimeter film that is stitched together by the artist. Um, each film is, in this piece we have three film quilts, each film is by distinguished female director or filmmaker. For instance, this is by Myron E. Wong. The artist, when she was studying film, she tired of working at a computer or at a desk, and she found refuge in crafts, in knitting and sewing and thus kind of came about this working with film as an almost sculptural material. And so the forms of these quilts are derived from quilting handbooks, which is traditionally, um, it's an American craft tradition, traditionally the preserve of female makers. And the abstraction of the form is kind of redolent of abstract painting from a distance, but up close we can see these tremendous details. In this film quilt, Sabrina has worked with film by Alice Guy Blachet. And in these reels, we can see the form of a dancer called Madame Bob Walters. And she was an incredible, innovative designer, or, or dancer rather, who lived in Paris in the early 20th century. And she created this dress that she would perform in and as she moved, it created all of these beautiful, different abstract forms. Not only does this work recognize the contribution of Alice Guy Blachet, but it also recognizes the contribution of this dancer. So in this room, we have a series of works by Juan Capistran. We have three photographs that document a series of temporary installations that the artist made in South Los Angeles. And that's the neighborhood that Juan grew up in. So these neighborhoods obviously witnessed the Los Angeles riots in 1992, and that's something that the artist lived through. So he wanted to return to different locations that were impacted by the riots, uh, which are captured in these photographs. So he went back to these sites and installed these oversized brick-like sculptures. And the brick is an interesting choice because it can be a symbol of rebuilding, or it can also be used as a weapon. It can be used in a riot. Um, it can be used as a way of rising up. So the artist very much was interested in the history of protest and in the effect of those riots on the landscape of the city. So these locations were burned down during the riots and nothing ever went to replace them. And so the scars of that experience can still be felt. Over here we have a brick sculpture. You can see the bricks that were used in the photographs in three dimensions. The artist has attached a balloon, or rather six balloons, that spell out the words gratis. And obviously gratis means free. Here we have artist zine that the artist has provided and it's a takeaway for our visitors to take with them when they leave the show. For this exhibition, Olga Kumandoras wrote a short story in which she reimagined her autobiography through the life cycle of a flying fish. And she chose the flying fish because it's a kind of transitory animal. It lives on the land, in the sea, and in the air. And this fish is a means of signaling the hybridity of identity, the many fluid possibilities that are open to us. In the sculpture, we can see it's made of ceramics, which is an earthbound material. And so she wanted to counteract that by having a number of references to kind of aerial symbols. So we have the lightning bolt sweeping through the base. We have this sky blue color, which is painted on the wings, which also help the fish fly in the air. And then we have these leggings that are attached to various parts of the sculpture, and they've been printed with a sky motif. So the fish is arranged with the tail at the front, 
Then we have the ribs that are on sole horses and the wings, ultimately leading to the head. And it's very important to the artist that the fish is presented in this kind of upward thrust. It's an uplifting movement. And the fish is very much on its journey, exploring different ways of being in the world. And in this way, the fish becomes an icon of liberation, a way of exceeding the binaries that society may try to impose on us. So for her contribution to the show, Sandy Rodriguez has created this large scale map depicting the San Gabriel and Santa Monica Mountains. Rodriguez is very interested in the history of the Americas before the conquest. And so she's very excited to explore different materials employed by indigenous peoples in their art making. To that end, the artist incorporates natural pigments, organic pigments in her work. So the brown in this map is actually derived from walnut. And a number of the other pigments come from plants that are native to the region. So while there are beautiful moments of hope with this rainbow overarching the map, we also have scenes of a darker nature. So the artist has charted the location of different detention centers in the region um, and looking at the history of incarceration. So for instance, we can see a lynching site here and we have these drones overhanging the landscape. So overall, Rodriguez is very interested in exploring the impact of colonization on the landscape. So in this installation, Jenny Yershansky has created a room that evokes a shadowy forest. And this is a kind of recreation of the site where her great grandfather is buried in Moldova. Here we have large scale embroidery and a number of quasi tree branches. And this work emerged out of the artist's investigation into the matrilineal history of her family. Her parents were refugees who escaped from Moldova. And in that process, the kind of trauma of that experience has led to a lot of the memories of her family being suppressed. And the artist was interested in uncovering more. So she and her mother returned to Moldova, visited this graveyard, and kind of encountered some of those histories. In these branches, we have a series of glass pieces that are called precision blanks, and optometrists use them to create lenses. And so the artist was playing on the irony of a lens, which is supposed to help you see clearly, in fact being a means of obscuring the stories of the past. Here we have a large scale embroidery that the artist created with her mother, which took several months to produce and is incredibly painstaking in its production. The form of the embroidery is adapted from a rubbing that the artist took at her great grandfather's headstone. In addition to that, her great grandmother was a seamstress and she actually passed on the skills of sewing and embroidery to Jenny and her family. And in actual fact, it was that skill of embroidery that enabled her grandmother to survive during the deprivations of World War II. So this work comprises a series of slide projectors that are stacked one on the other, but all of them are trained on the same image. And these images show the artist who's returned to her great-grandfather's gravesite in Moldova and preparing to take the rubbing. The reason the curtain is here is to kind of produce an obscuring effect. Even though we're straining to make sense of the image, the curtain and the veil kind of continually interrupts our gaze, and um, thus kind of symbolizing the way that memories get displaced and erased over time. Peter Wu created his work on the 200th anniversary of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And Frankenstein is the ultimate figure of a man undone by his own inventions. So Peter wanted to explore this idea of technology and the impact that our inventions can have on humanity. So when you will go into the space, you're going to see a structure in the middle, and inside of the structure is a 3D print of the artist's head. However, this is a very distorted print. On top of the structure, we have these projections that show different kind of colors and a representation of the artist's head speaking a monologue. This monologue is derived from an AI-generated text, and in it, the artist is kind of speaking about technology and where it will take us. Ultimately, Peter's work explores the ramifications of our creations and where they'll take us.